Professor Nigel Warden delivered his inaugural lecture titled The Global Cape, Breaking the Boundaries of the Early Cape Colony, delivered on 21 September to a packed lecture theater. Professor Warden was introduced by the Dean of Humanities to the expectation that this inaugural would be informative but also entertaining as Warden previously trained as an actor. Warden began his lecture with a brief audio recording of King George V. Of all that these 25 years have brought to me and to my He then went on to explain that history as a discipline was really only developed in the mid to late 19th century, most notably in the German state of the period, just at a time when nationalism was at its fall. And history, the subject of history, the discipline of history, was seen as being a necessary part of the construction of a nation state. It was seen to be important that a nation state has its own archives, its own collection of documentary material, which are by definition the product of the government of a particular nation. These are the archives which historians are expected to use. Historians were expected to produce definitive and official histories of those nations. The nation established a school curriculum, a school syllabus, which in all countries focused on the national story, the emergence of the nation state. And this was not only true, of course, for Germany, but it was also taken up by most other, all other European powers, the United States in the 19th century, and then in turn in the 20th century became a concept of history taken over also in post-colonial states, in Asia, in Africa, and also in Latin America, which also stressed the role of history in supporting the nation and the concept of the nation. But over the past decade, Warden, in his study of slavery in South Africa and Cape Town, became inspired by other scholars interested in the peculiarities of slavery in the Cape. Slave practices here, he now argues, often reflected slave practices in other corners of the world. The link of Cape history to other countries and regions was clear, if unexplored. And here were places that were the worlds from which many of the slaves at the Cape had come, but about whose lives in Madagascar or in Southeast Asia or in India or in Sri Lanka, we were completely ignorant. I had a great enthusiasm to try and recover those kinds of lives, those lives of a world in Asia and Madagascar before people came to the Cape, but I quickly discovered that it wasn't easy. The nature of slavery is that it ruptures life experiences. There are no records which, which uh, survive, or very few, which tell the story of complete lives in this kind of way. Once people were brought here, once they're put on ships, once they're offloaded here, that past tends to be completely ignored and neglected by uh, people who are keeping records of them here. Over the years, however, Warden has been able to piece together some stories from official documents or archived correspondence, be it of the Cape Slave Uprising of 1808, of the networks between the Cape and the slaves' homelands, of Malagasy refugees, or the social mobility of women slaves. Many of these kinds of ideas about the networks, the interconnections, particularly of the Indian Ocean world, and shows how many people, not just slaves, many people living in Cape Town during this period were deeply influenced by the forces of a wider world. Here we had soldiers who came from Germany, from Russia, sailors from Scandinavia, from Sri Lanka, from Indonesia, slaves from Mozambique, Madagascar, India, Southeast Asia, Chinese traders, convicts, both white and black, from Batavia and Ceylon. Did you know that Cape Town was the pre-Australian convict colony of uh, the Indian Ocean world? Asian political leaders with their slaves' retinues. And all of these people forged new lives and identities for themselves in Cape Town, but also and this is the crucial point, I think, kept links and contacts across these regions, either directly in the journeyings of their own lives, they traveled uh, across these regions, 
either voluntarily, or in the case of convicts and slaves, against their will, or through correspondence and keeping connections in that kind of way. And as his further study has shown, the social aftershocks of that period has been felt through the subsequent ages, its social and racial orders extending into later periods, even today. Fertile ground, Warden suggested, for the teaching and study of a new kind of history. When I was in Australia uh, a couple of years ago, I was at a conference where a notable historian of the Indian Ocean world, uh, Ken McPherson, uh, uh, was, was speaking. And in his inimitable style, Ken said, if we're going to talk about the Indian Ocean, then we've got to talk not just about land, but we've also got to give a whiff of ozone into our history. And I've been thinking about that. How do we give a whiff of ozone into the history of the Cape? The Cape, a world which is deeply, fundamentally part of the maritime world. Uh, this city, which has in the past and still is built up on communities which are own their livelihoods and their existence to the sea and the connections of the sea. I haven't yet got around to daring to suggest to my colleagues that we have a course called Ozone Studies but somehow, <laughs> somehow, I think George V would have approved. 